So, good morning, everyone, and uh, hello and good afternoon, those of you who are coming from elsewhere. Um, as always at Crick, it's, uh, it's a humbling experience because uh, we've had a journey over two or three days, John, of shared imaginations, shared challenges. And I woke up this morning and said, well, I have to rewrite what I'm going to say because this is a continuum mm -hmm. and there's things that we learn en route. But I wanted to start really by justifying what I do in a sense. And it seems quite an eclectic career. I started as an economist and I now am a professor at a center for peace, for trust, peace and social relations at Coventry, as John described. And I'm involved in the development of thinking and challenging around how we lead. And that's seriously important for the conversations we've had over the last few days here. But actually, this is all driven by a common focus. The existential challenge we face for human security, some of the fundamentals at work in our complex world. Um, and it seemed to me over time that there were things that really did create insecurity for people. Absolute poverty, the challenge of public health, the climate and its emergency. Unfortunately, in the 21st century, we've moved beyond states bashing each other in conflict, but we've moved into new eras of conflict between people and between people and ideologies and so forth. But above all, it came to my feeling, the emotions, that the real challenge that we face is our inability, our inexperience, and our general incompetence about living with difference, living in a diverse world where those diversities come up against each other. And that's what drives, I think, all, all my work currently. So, and I make no apology for that. I think if we cannot organize a world with processes that enable us to make sense of the diversity, and to make progress within it and through it, then we'll be in a sorry state. And we've heard lots of examples of that already. Like with most iterations, I'm always influenced by what I most recently read and hear. And, and Marta, your reference to mending was tremendous and it's really been powerful for me this morning. Thank you for your presentation. But, the thought we should actually work on mending things rather than replacing them, rather than recreating and making new mistakes. The concept of mending for me, and I've only been thinking about it since you referred to it, is about recognizing the sense of what is in its broken and imperfect form and being prepared to use simple creativity to rebuild and put it back on the table, whether that's a cup or whether that's a relationship or, or whatever. Two books that have been really influential that I had to reference because you'll see how they've influenced my thinking. The first is Mark Leonard's most recent book, The Age of Unpeace. I'd recommend it to you. It's, a, it's an argument Mark is a brilliant writer, I think, a brilliant policy analyst, but the age of unpeace talks about how the very connections that we seek to build relationships more positive actually are now becoming connections that endanger us as well. So this is a really interesting thing. And I think it's been a theme of some of the conversations over the last couple of days. The other book is less well um, advertised, um, Frank Rose who's a, a New Yorker, who's written a brilliant book on narratives and the power of narratives. And hasn't that come up in our discussions? The Sea We Swim In, have a look for it. It's a very powerful discussion based on stories and anecdotes of the power of the narrative. That we heard from Afghanistan, from our colleague and in other conversations. So my uh, contribution to this picks up on much of what's been said already. Um, um, Harvey yesterday and Jenny raised the issue of leadership 
and this notion for me that we can't just stagger forward as communities and as neighborhoods and as states. We do need a bit of help. And that help in our human coexistence comes from a process of pointing people in a certain direction. And that's in essence my notion of leadership and why I became interested in it. Um, because of the power it can bring to help us move forward in, in more positive ways. So John's title for my talk was great. Where does leadership come in? Well, I'm going to tell you where it comes in and I hope um, you can bear with me. So I've also went last night to add a bit of picture because we heard so much the power of a simple picture. And during the development of my center at Coventry, we brought in visual artists to try and capture very simple things. And this picture says more than I can say in the half hour I have. And I think it's, it's a wonderful, and there are many more in my center if you, if you look online um, of that kind. But essentially this first slide is trying to describe where I think we've got to over the past two or three days and why I feel confident that a few remarks I might make can add value. Really, we're talking about when all this is over, this chaos of lockdown, this disruption to our current relationships, what kind of world do we want? We can take control of that. And my passion for leadership says that we have a responsibility so to do. So it's not just a question of reverting to the normal, allowing us to be as we were. I don't know about you guys, but I look back at the beginning of the lockdown, and I don't think we we're in a very good place. And if we can use this disruption to create a better place, we have that responsibility. I don't want to go back to normal. The normal that I remember in 2019, in December, was not a very good normal for many people, for many families, for many uh, people, 67 million of whom are on the move globally trying to find what I and my family have, some form of security. So it wasn't a good place. And let's take opportunity to find the kind of world we want. And there are three things that came up during the conversation so for the last couple of days. One is that we now remind ourselves that structures are adaptable and can change. We don't have to be driven by structure. We need to change behaviors and culture as we've heard. And we can be different. And there are four examples on my list here, which are not exclusive, of course. We can change our approach to rules. We have done through lockdown and through a, the attempt to manage coexistence with this virus. We've experimented, we've done things well, and we've done things badly. But we can change our approach to rules. We can find different sources of strengths that we didn't realize existed. We know the problem with empathy fatigue, as was referred to, the power of empathy and its importance. Let's put it up there again. Let's remind ourselves of how significant it is. And my final comment is in this competitive world of 2019, let's come out of lockdown into a collaborative world and one that's not collaborative for self-interest, but it's collaborative because of the compassion that that needs to spread. So I know they're exhortations and they're easy words to say, but you know you, 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 know, you have to reflect after your Weetabix in the morning of what you can do to move things forward in a positive way. So my talk this morning is very, very simple and short. I know we're after coffee and, 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 and tea, but I want to do five things. I want to simply point you at what I think matters at the novelty of change of needs that we have. I want to look at how leadership needs to change and I use the word leadership and not leaders, and that's important. How we as a community of thinkers, of intellectuals can support that and nurture it. And a, a final comment about trust because I think trust for me is something I'm still working on and still struggling with, but it's a hugely important thing for us to explore further. 
So we live in an uncertain times. These three things matter to me. Leadership matters, clearly. I'm chair of an amazing organization, which is trying to examine and be uh, more disciplined in our approach to development. Relationships matter, as we've heard, fundamentally, and connections matter. And they're slightly different from relationships. We live in a time that's uncertain, unfamiliar, and uncommon, which offers more threat, in my view, than it does support for human security. Times that we must find better ways to interrelate as people and communities create and manage a sustainable future. The search for better ways involves leadership, both in style and in approach. And that's how we work in communities. Leadership in this sense is the practice of mobilizing people to tackle tough challenges and to thrive, to mobilize people to tackle tough challenges. That definition matters to me, and it means we have to understand the challenges. We have to take responsibility for really making sense of the challenges we face, and they're complex. So the encounter, exchange, and engagement that we've heard about that describes the formative connections between us bind us together, but also drive us apart. And I think we need to create, we need to recalibrate, to mend our approach to human security as a consequence. The digital age is a different one. I don't understand it sufficiently. I can work my little gadgets, but the digital age is more than that. It's created a, a new way of interconnecting that is both positive and hugely negative, both and at the same time. So no longer will our pursuit of freedoms from want, freedoms from fear, freedoms to live in dignity be sufficient. Even with all those freedoms, they will be trumped by human insecurity of connectivity. And we need to reflect more on that. And I haven't time to explore all the ideas that that are racing around in my head. Defining the effectiveness of leadership or its measurement is shaped by an historical trajectory of political theory attributed to the development of the concept. John referred to my current mission with the ILA. The ILA is intensely a North American organization and it deserves to be more. So we're trying to drag it out of the, the thinking and, 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 uh, and wealth of understanding that the Americans, North Americans generally have brought to this. But also been captured leadership and leadership studies by the business schools, by taking a very purposeful leadership and pouring it on the bottom line of, of capitalist companies and, and others. So of course, there are many others like um, James McGregor Burns and George Soros who have been fighting that for many years and to take up some of that challenge has been a real privilege. But defining the effectiveness of leadership is shaped by history, by political science. It's attributed to the development of the concept that we now know it. Um, in turn, this impacts the research design of those studying it. Critically, the steps that policymakers must take to try and improve it. In essence, the meaning attributed to more effective leadership greatly impacts the mechanisms thought to foster it. And I should come on to re refer to a few of my, and I have to do it quite briefly, a few of the research findings that I have. I'm doing a major study now of uh, ideas about leadership and effective leadership through a series of uh, interviews with global influencers. Well, I can call them global influencers. Um, they're people who care and people who are on positions that can have influence. And uh, the, the initial research um, that I'll show you this morning is just exciting. It's just really exciting. And I have to take responsibility with my team for, for moving that forward and bedding it into greater data sets than we currently have. So the current research that I'm interested in is in public leadership, the leadership of publics taking the sense of where we are in crisis and challenge and helping people move it into a positive place. It's focused really by an anxiety 
that the governance of human security, of our safety and our well-being, is and the governance that we have on offer in this 21st year of the 21st century is not fit for purpose, and nor can it be tweaked and adjusted to make it so. We need a whole new roadmap from this place to one more likely to meet human security needs in the changed context and in the challenges we must understand. That we're in a new context seems obvious, and we've heard a lot about it over these days in this time of pandemic. Mark Leonard's book, I found interesting because it pointed me at the notion that we're at the gates of a new and silent phenomena, and a, a domain like the coronavirus pandemic, that's traveling, that's leaving and arriving without pattern, without purpose, without prevention. The new pandemic is exploiting connections and constantly adapting to avoid our control. It thrives on human to human relationships and, con and contacts and is manifested in behaviors that exploit weaknesses and vulnerabilities in the world that we have. So analysis of the empirical evidence of the interrelationship between social and structural elements of leadership leads us to argue for a differentiation between two kinds of definitions. Those which offer a static description of a more participative and inclusive process versus a dynamic conceptualization of leadership as a political and economic process. Paradoxically, explicating the opposing aims of definitions could in fact provide consensus on the conceptualizations themselves. And the disagreement may lie in what the definitions aim to do. So relationships matter. Through this analysis, we find the most significant divergence to be whether definitions are entirely social, are they about solidarity, shared values, and a sense of belonging, or whether they incorporate structural conditions, deprivation, inequality, discrimination. I draw significantly on the literature in my work of social capital, of the mechanisms by which individuals and sometimes communities build collaborative bonds and bridges, but also on the recognition that social capital literature avoids some of the most important social relationships between individuals and institutions. So we need a new leadership that will help make sense of the potentials and realities in our complex world, as well as to help make positive changes to that world. And this does suggest that we need to search for new understandings and new arrangements for leading. And one that might not resemble the models that we currently know. Let me move on to look at some of the research. And I find this really exciting. You might not, but you'll tell me over coffee. <laughs> so these are eight changes in the way we even conceptualize about leadership and its role. Remember my definitions? Leadership is about mobilizing people. It's not about charging out with a flag up front, however attractive the Solidarity logo was. The Solidarity logo was absolutely in my thinking. Um, I didn't realize it until I saw it last night, of course. These people that are leaning together, that are working together, that are drawing strength from each other. I found the whole exhibition um, a really stimulating. Thank you for bringing it. So the eight changes. So much of the literature and so much of my understanding about leadership is challenged by this first change. We have to ask the right questions. We're more likely to get the right answers in, in a sense, but often it's assumed that leaders and stakeholders know the right questions to ask. And in change context, it is not necessarily the case. So the one thing we know about uncertainty is that it's uncertain. And we need to develop a concept of leadership that's prepared to challenge the norms, to challenge the way it asks and the questions it answers. We need leadership that can be comfortable with complexity. Not all is. Not all processes of, of people leading other people are comfortable or patient with complexity. 
They prefer linear approaches to this problem solving. We must have governance. We must have organizations whose job is to cultivate trust, not to jump to outcomes and solutions. Trust is a way of relating, which is more conducive to collaborative, uh, collaborative work. We have to cultivate it. When I go down through these lists, these are findings as the, the main eight that came out of the current research. Um, I always think of leaderships that I know, that I watch, maybe, whether it's my government, my local government, my university, my neighborhood. And I think about, you know, how much are they doing these things? Not a lot. A new leadership must be more agile and more adaptive to change. Of course, we've heard a lot about agility already and the need to jump, the need to respond quickly, to be on the front foot. It needs, leadership needs to invest in continuous learning. I've spent two and a half days here and I've learned a huge amount. And why isn't that the norm with the development of leadership processes? We need a governance that engages with the whole and not just bits, not just the elites, not just the city, not just um, the, the norm that engages with the whole. And we saw that, didn't we, in our first video presentation this morning the importance of sitting around with the whole and understanding and being, being emotionally driven by the needs of the whole. And a leadership that, that in a collaborative, connected world, there will be winners and losers. And a leadership has to actually be better at managing loss resulting from change than celebrating wins. Think how you might approach Brexit and the whole discussion of that, if we focused on how we manage the losses rather than simply how we celebrate the gains. And finally, inevitably, there is the need to mainstream the relationship between local and global. In our connected world, we can no longer keep these in separate little bubbles. And leadership that tries to fails. Change leadership. So when I asked my respondents, you know, how, how should we change this? I have to tell you, it took a long time to persuade my respondents that we weren't talking about leaders, people, individuals, personalities, that we were talking about a process. But once we had, very interesting. They said, you know, the leadership of the future that meets the and makes sense of the complexity and the challenges has to be one with a non-negotiable commitment to ethics and an ethical approach. The real bonds of community are those that recognize the integrity of action and ethics matter. And we shouldn't be un uh, apologetic about stating it right up front. This is really interesting find. This is standard and to be expected. So the respondents referred to inclusive and representative of all stakeholders, however uncomfortable that means, however minorities get in the way and they're noisy and so forth. We heard a lot, didn't we, about the importance of listening. And I was really interested, Padraig's um, uh, was a great session on that. But you know, it's not just the ability to listen and the skills of listening. It's can you hear? Do you hear? And once you've heard, do you reflect on the conversation itself? I often tell the story of when I worked in East Jerusalem in, with Abu Ammar, with um, Arafat's administration. I was a very young economics advisor, but I learned so much just by watching. And at my leaving do in Ramallah, when I left John, I came at the end of my 10 months of, of being in the bunker. Arafat said very graciously, came and shook my hand and said, goodbye, I have this wonderful photograph on my desk. Not that I'm hero worshiping at all. He had many challenges himself, but I said, well, how are things going generally? I'm leaving now and I feel in this period between intifadas, between 
and the implementation, the struggle to implement the first Oslo Accord. He said, well, we're talking. And I remember the exchange we had and I said, but is anyone listening? So this is a sort of clever little diplomatic comment that you make on your way out, you know, I was a very small and junior, still out of course. But. So uh, he said, Mr. Mike, they used to call me Mr. Mike, Mr. Mike, they are listening, but they don't hear. <laughs> and I learned that then, and that was a long time ago. This was a guy, you know, I worked with his team for 10 months. He never spoke to me in English. He spoke fluent Arabic, of course, in French, and I, I have a little French, so he spoke to me in French. And in my leaving do, he spoke to me in English. He said, thank you very much, goodbye, he didn't say much. And I said, Abu Amma, you, for 10 months, you, you made me struggle in my bad French, and you have this perfect English. And he looked at me and he said, why would I talk to you in your mother tongue and my second tongue? Mm -hmm. So I learned about asymmetrical dialogue immediately incredible experiences that you can harness, but the ability to listen here and reflect on conversation, I was so pleased came out of the respondents. This is an important quality of leadership. A really, really powerful point that I hadn't picked up on straight away was the importance of multi-generational multi, multi solidarity. We talk often about this generation, the next generation. Think of the climate debate and how we lead ourselves in that. It'll be the next generation who have to pay the problems. We are picking up national debt. Actually, it's the now generation that matters. It's multi-generational solidarity that is important in effective leadership. And there's much more work needs to be done here on the way in which the young and the old interface and interact. Food for thought. And a leadership that is finally defined by questions and not answers. Very few politicians run into elections based on questions alone. They feel an obsession with having all the solutions to share, to win attraction. But actually, the most effective leadership is defined by questions and by a humility that's underpinning this admission that you don't always know the answer. How can we support? I said we come on to say, how can we mobilize ourselves to support the development of new thinking on leadership? I think we have to know more about a series of questions ourselves. I think that we don't know enough about the questions of complexity and the adaptive systems that are spawned by complexity. I know John's having a conversation later this morning. We need to think more about complexity and how it should challenge the way we approach um, the world and its, and its imperfections. We have a question of power. I don't think we understand this sufficiently within the development of leadership. There's lots of debates in the business schools and elsewhere about the relationship between authority and leadership and legitimacy. But the whole question of power, we need to study more. We need to reflect on more and be prepared to, through our reflections, be more supportive of leadership as it develops. And there's the question of the possibility of a solutions base. The question of possibility and potential has come up a lot, but that's the important word. What's feasible, what's potential, but also what's possible? are really important in defining the direction of travel towards solutions. And finally, we have to know more about empathy, how to promote it, how to encourage it, and more about compassion and how to embed it in our relationships. Compassion, you have to work at. It's rather like John was referring to the, the notion of intolerance earlier in our discussions. Why should we have to work on these things? Well, we do. We have to work on empathy. We have to work on, on, on compassion. I don't apologize for approaching this conceptually. I've shown you a few um, um, of the initial findings of the research that I'm currently engaged in. And 
I hope this will form the basis of uh, the book I'm doing with, with Cambridge University Press, which I hope by the end of next year. And I'd really welcome any comments or, or challenges uh, from you all. Um, the joy of coming to Crick is that we're a family that can expose mm -hmm. our, our inadequacies um, on, on, with the knowledge that there'll be someone there to help you become better. This is um, my final comment, John, about trust and why it's so important. And I, this is something that I'm working on currently, the need to look both at vertical and horizontal trust in our interconnected world. We tend to focus and the literature in the social sciences focuses mainly on horizontal trust between people, the work on out groups and in groups. So in this particular schema, I'm becoming quite confident that where I want to go, the direction of challenge is towards the top right-hand segment, that we want a leadership which is high on participation, high on engagement, and high on the other qualities that I referred to in the findings. And that will require us to be very clear about where we lie on the spectrum of trust and horizontally how much and I started this presentation by referring to the challenge we have at living with difference. How well do we cope in our out-group, in-group world? Not very well, I'm afraid. But also the vertical between our relationship as individuals with institutions. And one of the um, clearest observations that I can make of the current time is that our loss of trust in institutions, be they bankers from 2007, or be they governments, or be they World Health Organizations, or whatever. So our, the collapse of trust between individuals and institutions is a fundamental problem and an obstacle to moving in any direction towards a type of leadership that I think the 21st century requires. Thank you, John.